just a drag here. When the first DDG came to Eastport, uh, the captain was concerned because it has a huge sonar dome uh, made out of rubber under the bow. It's the largest rubber casting in the world to this day. The Navy bought a guppy aircraft so they could, it has an extra wide side so they could get this rubber in and fly it from the manufacturer to the shipyards in Bath and to the shipyards in Pascagoula that make these and to the repair yards when they need to get repaired. The uh, draw, it's a, the DDG normal draft is 25 feet except for this piece of rubber that sticks down the bow and it's 33 feet deep there maybe 34 depending on the ballast on um, the fuel load. Aft, they have two screws that hang down and they're drawn 27, 28 feet. So it does stick way down below the hull. At the front of our dock here, at the time, before we rebuilt it, we had 39 feet of water. I had the state police dive team come and uh, Marine Patrol and they dove the entire pier to make sure there were no obstructions. People have dumped safes off the pier. They've dumped cars off the pier. There's been a lot of different things that we've found in these security sweeps. And they want to make, and this is before 9-11, but they weren't as concerned about bombs, but they were really concerned about something in the water and having one of these ships sit on it. So the captain said, well, it's a minus two foot tide today. So instead of 39 feet, now you've only got 37 feet. And he says, I'm concerned that we have calculated this correctly, and I would like to have a diver go down and look at the bottom. And I said, uh, well, we hadn't made the arrangement, but I looked down on the pier, and Greg's standing there. And <laughs> I knew he was a diver for the aquaculture companies and did other work with moorings. And I hollered down at him, and I said, Greg, where's your diving gear? Oh, it's in the car. <laughs> I said, go get it, and please go under the hull and tell me the distance from the bottom uh, on the, the bottom of the ship to the bottom of the pier, uh, the bottom of the uh, uh, channel. Said, okay. So he walks up the street. He had a dry suit. He gets his dry suit on. He gets all his gear. A couple guys help him. They get down onto the pier. He jumps off the pier and he goes under. I did make sure that they had the sonar shut off before he, <laughs> he went in. So he goes down, and meanwhile, we finish tying up, they're getting the gangway out. The gangway system is all set up, and on the dock is the welcoming party. The welcoming party consisted of the city manager, the head of the Chamber of Commerce, the Port Authority people, the um, Fourth of July committee people, not quite a crowd, but they just stood there on the dock and didn't come aboard. And the, the command master chief's down there and he's telling them, hey, you're welcome to come aboard now. The captain says, look, I want to get this show on the road. And he, I said, Captain, we have a slight problem. We have a tradition here that the official party doesn't come aboard until the mayor's there to lead them aboard. And he said, and? And I said, well, the mayor isn't there. We have to wait. And he, he was really getting upset with me. He said, Mr. Pilot, I want that group to come aboard. And I said, no, they're not, they're not coming aboard. He says, well, where's the damn mayor? And I said, he's underneath your hull right now, <laughs> checking, <laughs> uh, checking the tank. Oh. And the entire the entire bridge was just roaring about, about this. Years later, at that time, he was president of the city council. And under Article 2.04, the president of the city council is the acting mayor of Eastport for ceremonial and military uh, work. And that's why he was the mayor. So the, years later, I go to the Pentagon. And I meet this admiral in, in a uh, meeting, and he asked where I was from. And I said, well, I'm from Lubeck, Maine at the time, Whiting. 
And he said, uh, what are you doing? I said, I'm the ship pilot in Eastport, Maine. And this three-star admiral looks at me and he says, is that the place where the mayor was underneath the <laughs> This story went across the Navy. So thank you for that. You, you were very helpful. Yes, sir. I'm sorry? Who was the clearance? The, what was the distance between the, the bottom of the hull and the bottom of the sea? There's the man that was down there. About six feet. Yeah. We, after that, we built a, uh, a stand, a metal stand, flat bottom, and we put a camera on it, an underwater camera, and I took my yacht and put it uh, inside the ship and ran the wire up to the, to the yacht and I could plug it into the navigation system and at low tide, we had a stick sticking up, numbered, and we could watch the ship come down and see how close it got to our predictions. It would change some with the tide anyway, but it was, uh, it was something that just, we were nervous. We did not want to uh, have that sonar dome hit the bottom. Well, anyway, uh, my name's Bob Peacock. I originally was uh, from Bangor two days after I was born. I got to Lubeck, and they remind me that to this day. But, uh, let me get this going. Yeah. So I'm going to try to go through this fairly quickly, but I want to do quite a bit about the history because those of you that are from here probably know some of it, but there's a lot to it. And our history goes back uh, at least to just after the Revolutionary War. We know for sure that after the War of 1812, we had ships come here. Uh, the War of 1812 didn't end in Eastport until 1819, when the Brits finally got booted out of here. But they, uh, after 1819, there were calls here um, that came for the 4th of July. There is a photograph of a ship in here in the 1860s, after the Civil War, uh, that came in for the 4th of July. And there's been a fairly good number of documented <coughs> ship's photographs uh, since then. Bud Finch, our former city manager, is a real historical buff in naval photographs. And he uh, was uh, diligent in finding these things all over the place. So the, uh, we'll go through who the eSport team is. We'll show you the planning, the communications, and the performance and discuss the future a little bit about what's going to happen. So this is the USS Savannah and it was from 1923. This was taken in Eastport and this is the oldest photograph I happen to have here. Uh, but it just shows you that this has been going on a long time. It's 99 years ago. The, we've had ships almost every year. I'd say maybe in, the la in that 99 period of time, there's only been about 10 years where we didn't have a ship. And that includes during the war, we had a lot of ships come here. Not just, not so much for the 4th, but they were in the harbor. This is the USS S-22 submarine. This submarine sank off, um, after this photo was taken, off of um, Nantucket in about 60 to 80 feet of water. And over a three day period of time, they were able to rescue almost all the crew, wow. one at a time. Uh, and it, it uh, had a lot to do with, uh, this is just before the war, it had a lot to do with the safety gear that was on submarines that got uh, attacked and went down. And some people did get out because of what happened on this one. This is the USS Indianapolis in 1933. It came here to pick up Franklin Roosevelt. The, I'm not sure on the timing if he was president or not, but he was Secretary of the Navy just before that, so I assume that that was part of the reason. The Indianapolis is the ship that um, carried the A-bomb from the United States to Tinian uh, for the atomic attack on Japan. When it left, uh, Tinian, it was headed for the Philippines. It was hit by a Japanese submarine torpedo and it sunk in about 15 minutes. There was about 1,600, 700 uh, sailors aboard. 800 of them got into the water and survived. But 
the signal didn't get out from the ship where they were, and they weren't found for five days. And in that five days, they went from 800 and some odd people in the water down to 300 because of sharks. Yeah. Sharks killed 500. And it, uh, so it's got a long history, but part of it was here in Eastport. This is the USS Corporal in 1971. I graduated from May Maritime in 1971, in May, May 1st. <laughs> One of my classmates, a guy named Fred Terrian from Lewiston, he, um, in, he went right into the Navy as an ensign, and he got sent to this USS Corporal. He later became the head of all uh, nuclear um, reactor maintenance on U.S. submarines and on U.S. Uh, surface ships on some of the carriers. And he, he, he was telling me a story about the corporal, and I ran across this photograph. I said, hey, that's, that was here. The uh, USS Sellers was here in 1983, and the captain was a guy named Richard Janay, who I later sailed with on the USS New Jersey. He was the executive officer on the New Jersey. And he then went to the Pentagon, and I served with him in the Pentagon under him. <laughs> we were coming in in dense fog, and I mean, we couldn't see anything. They got to the dock, and I, I'm working in the radar, and I told them I th we're about 40 feet off the pier, and nobody could see the pier. <coughs> we could hear people talking <laughs> on the pier, but we couldn't see it. It was that thick. So he says, what do you think? I says, pass the lines over and we'll start working her in. And he, we didn't have a tug at the time. He hauls down to the, from the bridge to the foredeck, which is very close, to the bosun, and he says, bosun, throw the heaving line. And the bosun, he was a first class petty officer. He turned around and he looked up at the captain and he said, which effing side captain? <laughs> <laughs> And I'll never forget that as long as I live, <laughs> I tell you. <laughs> Nor did he. So the, the captain was very frustrated, and he points out to the dock and, throw it. Yes, sir. The guy threw the heaving line, and the monkey fist hit a woman in a wheelchair. <laughs> <laughs> right? And we heard the entire crowd groan. <laughs> right? And we knew we were in trouble. <laughs> a lot of trouble. But the captain, he was a politician. That's why he ended up in the Pentagon. He decided to make her the queen of the ball. <laughs> she ate in the wardroom two dinners just for her with all the officers. They, she was not completely uh, ambulatory, but he, he was made sure that she got aboard. And she had a wonderful time. And she told me after this thing sailed, I saw her once, and she said, that was the best thing that ever happened to me in my life. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, when uh, Janae retired, he bought a place in North Quebec, uh, I think from the same guy that built our house here in Eastport, Walter Giranti, and beautiful place. But he had a uh, medical problem and decided to move back to Colorado, uh, where his family and his wife is. So he didn't stay here very long, but he want, he loved this place. It's very similar. A lot of the people that come here for the 4th of July end up coming back for various reasons, but a lot of them, mostly because they love it. I got this picture from uh, Mike Morse, and the ship loved this picture. They really did. They thought this was one of the best pictures of their ship. And the San Jacinto is a guided missile cruiser, and the captain was Doug Nashold. Doug was, uh, came in here on the USS Porter as captain, and he liked it so much. Uh, we gave him the Boston Whaler, and they went up Cobscook Bay, he and the XO. We didn't see him for hours. They finally got back and just fell in love with the place. So when he gets on the San Jacinto as captain, which is, he was a commander when he was here before, he was captain when he got on this, he put in to come back to Eastport. And four other crewmen on that ship had been to Eastport before on the border with him. They kind of followed him. They liked him so much, they tried to get assigned to his ship. And they were all happy to come back. But he 
ended up, uh, when the ship was here, uh, he came to our house and brought his family. They came up from, from uh, Norfolk and stayed at our house. We moved on our yacht so that they'd have the house for their kids. And he, they, all of them to this day said it's the best vac family vacation they ever had together. But they really enjoyed it. The main maritime training ship, although it's not a Navy ship, it's been here twice. Um, this was in 2018, and they really enjoy it here. The cadets have a great time, and it's, uh, it's for them, it's good training because of the tide and handling the ship, the winds. It's a great place to bring the ship for the cadets. This is Commander Janet Day at the time. Uh, she's commanding officer of the USS McFall in 2018. The first time the McFall came here, Mary Jackson was the captain. She was the first woman captain we had come in. She, Mary Jackson, then uh, made it to Admiral and eventually to Vice Admiral. Uh, President Obama promoted her to Vice Admiral. This lady was a uh, combat soldier in the Army, enlisted man, enlisted woman. And she is one fun, tough cookie, I'll tell you. She is something. Nicest personality, but you could tell with the crew when she said something, they jumped. They respected her, number one, and they feared her, number two. <laughs> but she, uh, she just loved this place. And what we try to do with all the captains and the crews is get them away from the ship and have a good time in someone's home, uh, give them the boat, let them take the boat and go out. And in this particular case, maybe. We invited the, uh, some of the officers and top enlisted people out to the house and we had a party. She gave us a plaque, but she really, really enjoyed it. When she got off of the, when she finished her uh, tour duty on this ship, she went to the Pentagon and she's an admiral. Mm -hmm. So both the women that have come here as captains, mm -hmm. both ended up as admirals in the Navy. But her coming as an enlisted man from an Army combat training to become a, an admiral in the Navy, wow. and she had told me later that she took a lot of help from the Navy, <laughs> Navy guys coming out of the Army. Mm -hmm. On this same particular ship, uh, we had Master Chief Petty Officer Sarah Gomez. And the, sun, the reason I put this picture in here is take a look at the ribbons mm -hmm. on this, and this Ribbons there that are for combat and ribbons for uh, uh, Silver Star. This woman is really something. And she uh, ended up retiring right after they were here. But the, it, it's funny, uh, we saw a change about, I would say, 2012, 2013, in the crews and were all male. And then you started seeing a lot of female crewmen. In about 2014, 15, we started seeing women commanding officers. And they both they both made admiral for a reason. But she she is uh, she was just finishing up being in the navy. She had gotten her master's degree and was going to go for a doctor. As one sharp lady. This is a great picture I took. And this this shows you what it's like to be a sailor in Eastport. They love it here. And the reason they love it here is they're treated so well by everybody. They really are. And it makes a huge difference. When you're a young sailor and you get off the ship and you go ashore and all of a sudden you're the hero. You know, they, This town treats the sailors good and how every single 
one of them gets treated is why they all want to come back. This is the Dunham, the last ship we had here. And <laughs> this ship, if you could see it from the other side, is one of the biggest rust buckets I've ever seen. <laughs> she had just finished a year in the North Atlantic and with no maintenance, no downtime, and she was headed home to Norfolk. <coughs> and they're going to finally get to go to their home port after a year of being out. And uh, I, think I think it was 11 months since they'd been back to the States. They painted the whole side of that ship in that three days. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> got everything straightened out. They didn't have the bunting. The bunting got sent to my house, and we took it out with the pilot boat <laughs> and on the way in there, putting it all off. Of. But it just, it was... The ship, the other ship that was assigned here, she had an engineering problem. Everything had been working out fine, and then all of a sudden, three days before she's <laughs> supposed to be here, bang, he's just going by Nova Scotia. They just grabbed it and said, you're going to Eastport. So that, there was a, a great visit, and this picture, uh, Donnie Dunbar took it, and we're lucky to have him taking these photographs because he does such a nice job with his all photography. And this is the real reason. This was on the Gonzales. And the captain on the Gonzales uh, proposed to his wife on the stern of the ship during the fireworks. And he made Admiral. And she, <laughs> she, she was a captain. But when these sailors come around that corner down by the, the uh, post office and the crowd starts cheering, and they've been cheering all the way down, it really affects them. I guarantee you, every single one of them never forgets it, ever. They don't get treated like that very often. So, to make all this happen, it takes a team of about 250 people total. And I've counted up the names of everybody that I know that's involved. But a, basically, we have a team of groups, and each group does a certain thing. And the 4th of July committee is the real uh, brains behind the whole thing and makes it work. And Brother Mitchell, Heine, uh, Kirsten Pastore, uh, Barbara McPhail, uh, man, did she do a great job. Whitney Vincent's doing it now along with, with uh, Sonia. And they can, it's amazing the amount of work it takes. And they don't get paid, they, they volunteers. The, uh, the July 4th committee members, uh, all of these people have been at it a long time, but Gloria is the secretary and the uh, treasurer, and it takes a lot of money to make the 4th of July celebration come off, and Gloria does a great job of getting the requests out and taking care of the money. Um, uh, Judy is the uh, secretary, but these people... The, the amount of work they do, until you see it, you can't believe it. It's fabulous. We have the Eastport Port Authority. The, the Port Authority funds a lot of what happens out of their operations. Um, because the, the tugs, the line handlers, the, uh, all the arrangements for, for a lot of different things, and you'll see that later, that have to be done come in through the Port Authority. Chris Gardner has been nothing but great about supporting the uh, City of Eastport gets involved heavily. And the city manager, who's new here, she hasn't been through this yet. And she's going to learn. It's quite the experience. The uh, police department, uh, it's a lot of work for them. The fire department uh, really helps with the parade and doing all that. Uh, the Public Works Department is heavily involved in putting up the barricades and uh, putting the bunting up overhead. Oh, that's all done by Public Works. And the uh, sewer department gets involved because they hook the ship's sewer. Uh, th those ships can only hold enough sewage for two to three days. That's it. Then it has to either go overboard, it's treated, but it goes overboard, or it goes ashore. And that's why we don't want it going overboard here with the aquaculture and everything else, so they pump it ashore. So the sewer department uh, gets
gets this surge um, of uh, about 25 to 35 percent more per day than any other days of the year when the ship's in. The uh, security team, there's a lot I can't say about the security, but there's some stuff I can. And on this security team, the, uh, of course, we've got the police department. And the Pleasant Point Tribal Police, they are so good to us. They have more police officers than we do, and they put all of them, every one of them, on duty night and day. And they're great. Uh, the Maine State Police Dive Team, I've worked for them now for 38 years. They've come down and never have a question. If I need divers, they say what time, where, and they search the tugs, the bottom of the tugs. Uh, they search the pilot boat. Any vessel that's going to go near or touch that ship is searched for bombs, for, for explosives, uh, both inside and outside on the hull. They also sweep the bottom uh, to make sure they check the, the pilings to make sure nothing's attached to the pilings. This, that goes on usually starting at 6 in the morning on the, on the day the ship's arriving. And it takes about six to eight hours. And usually they use a couple, three tanks of air, each one of them. And there's about 15 people in the dive team. Uh, Maine Marine Patrol takes the dive team around, and some of the Marine Patrol members are a part of the state police team. The Mounties, International Border Enforcement Team. And they have two boats, and they usually provide us three guys in each boat or girls, and they uh, provide the security from offshore into the American waters. And they, <laughs> I found out a protester uh, that the Mounties don't have the same delicate sense of dealing with people that <laughs> the Americans do. They, they had a guy who was protesting and he had a, a two kayaks and they had a sign up between them. And the two Mountie boats went in and they picked the bow of the kayaks up and they pulled them onto the stern of their boats and they took them about five miles offshore between the wolves and oh East Quarty Head. And they set them back down in the water and they said, protest away, have a good time. You know, I don't think you'd get away that in the States. But, uh, the Coast Guard Station in Eastport, there's 21 people there. We get all of them. Washington County Sheriff's Department, they provide usually around eight officers. Um, because this is a day and night thing, so you've got to have at least two ships, sometimes three. You've got the Border Patrol, they're fabulous. I've got a great Border Patrol story for you. They have uh, paddy wagons uh, that uh, basically, uh, they bring them down, and they park them outside the bars, and they open the back doors, and they tell the sailors when they come out, you don't have to, usually have a little bit to drink, and they tell them you don't have to walk back to the ship, this is a taxi service. <laughs> right. Well, geez, the sailors kind of got nervous about, yeah, they, they, they were, when they got in the back of that, they were all looking nervous. So the next time, the next night when they come back, both of these paddy wagons have a big taxi sign they got up in the callus mounted on the top of it to sit taxi. You know? But that's the kind of cooperation. The sailors never forget that. They, they don't get treated like that in other ports, that's for sure. Uh, United States Customs Officers, they always send down an extra four or five officers. Um, they're armed, they're trained, they really give us a lot better security. And we've got the boat crew, the pilot boat crew, they're trained. We've, we've got Fisheries and Oceans Canada in Campobello. Uh, they've got a couple boats. And the Canadian Vessel Traffic Service is in Halifax. It's Fundy Traffic, and we deal with them on every ship, but they really help with the Navy. But what's interesting is, all the boats that all these people have are out there, and when the ship's coming in, it has as many as eight patrol boats around it. And every single captain has said to me, we go into Norfolk, we don't get anything like this. <laughs> they love it. They think it's really different. We have a political team, and this is important, and it's the main reason why we're getting ships is when Senator Collins and Senator King say we want a ship, the Navy stands up and salutes and said yes. I mean, there's, sometimes they can't, but they try. And 
Carol Wilcock and Chris Rector are their regional representatives, and they, they're the ones that actually talk to the Navy. So there's a formal thing that goes on, I'll show you in just a minute, but it's basically these people uh, pushing the Navy to get us a ship here. And we've always, Maine has always had strong senators, very strong senators. And you look back in my lifetime to Margaret Chase Smith and from then on, and when those senators want something, they can generally get it. Uh, then there's the Navy team, and I've got Captain John J.J. Costello's name in yellow. He is the most important person in all of this because he was, uh, he's been doing the port visit coordination for the Navy, and that's the entire Atlantic, you know, both sides. Uh, he, he just, he's the one that decides which ship goes where and you know, when, uh, when they're coming, that, all that. He has done that for 35, I've been, you know, he's been doing it, I've done this for 40 years, and I dealt with him 40 years ago. So after his Navy career got done, he went to retire, and there was a rule that you couldn't go back in the same job as a civilian uh, for three years. And when the Senate heard that he was going to be not able to do the job for three years, they waived that rule for him, and he went right in again. So he's been there ever since. He's still there now. I hope he stayed for a while. Uh, Brian Kerbitz, uh, we worked with him for three or four years, and he fell in love with this place, brought his girlfriend up, and he just got transferred to Italy. He's doing the same job in the Mediterranean now. Uh, but he, he just makes sure that everything operationally goes good for the Navy when they're up here. Great guy to deal with. And then uh, the NCIS sends his uh, Carl Fritchhorn up, and he's based out of Portsmouth uh, Naval Base in New Hampshire, and he, oh, Kittery, and he uh, he loves it up here. And the last year when he came up, he bought his wife and kids, and they spent a week here. So it's it's a personal thing to all of them. It isn't just my job. When they start bringing their families, you know that they they enjoy it. So, all of this comes from planning. So, how we get a ship is a pretty uh, semi-formal way. The 4th of July committee requests a ship, and they send a letter to the politicians. Usually, uh, the politicians send out a joint letter. They all sign it, all main delegation, to the Navy saying, Eastport wants a ship. Can we get it? So. The Navy then funds the visit, and they notify Captain Costello in Norfolk that, uh, usually in February, which is, it happened in January this year, that yes, the Navy wants a ship uh, to come up here, the Senators have asked for it, and we're going to fund it. So then Costello starts looking around and seeing what ships want to come up here. This year, he's got three ships that are begging to come here. <laughs> One is a DDG. Uh, that was Lassen that was here a couple years ago, four years ago. One is a brand new uh, amphibious uh, dock ship that carries uh, the big Hoover craft, the really big ones, and it also carries the newest Marine Corps uh, eight-wheeled uh, landing uh, attack vehicles. Those carry 19 troops, and they can go at seven and a half, eight knots. They got two propellers and and the wheels. What he wants to do, he's called me, is bring it in, take the Hoovercraft out, and show everybody what one of these things can do, because they can do 60 knots, mm -hmm. the Hoovercraft. Mm -hmm. The Hoovercraft are much bigger than this building. They are something. Mm -hmm. And then he says, and we'll take the, the day of the, the parade, we'll take our, our landing vehicles, put them in the water, run them up the boat ramp, and put them in the parade. Oh, and wow. he said, I'll bring enough Marines to run them, and every Marine in Maine, ex-Marine, there's no such thing as ex-Marine, but every former Marine <laughs> in Maine will be coming to see that, because yeah. these, I have not seen one personally, but I have seen them uh, on uh, YouTube videos, and they're incredible. So if we can get a dozen of those in the parade, that'll be something. Yeah. So the third ship is a supply ship, and she's about the size of the Riviera that was in here, the passenger ship. And the captain of that was here 
Uh, I thought just once before, but turns out he's been here three times. He was an enlisted man first, and then he got to be an officer, and he's been here twice. So now he wants to come. So I got these three ships that are juggling around and all saying, "Tell Costello you want us," you know. <laughs> so right now um, we have uh, Jesse that runs the the uh, food truck downtown. Her son is a sonarman on the uh, on the uh, first ship that wants to come to Latin, the DDG. So there are relatives of people that want to come up here. Um, so once Costello uh, starts figuring out which ships are available, he talks to us, and then by usually the 1st of May, he's picked the ship, and he lets the senators, the vessel CO, the commanding officer, and the pilots know. And the senators then notify the 4th of July committee and the city manager officially. The pilots uh, then contact the commanding officer, the executive officer, the supply officer, and the command master chief and the Eastport Port Authority, and we start working the maritime side of this. Usually about the 1st of June, the dates are firmed up for what day they'll arrive and what day they'll sail, and that's important because of the tides. We've got to know what time they should come in and when, and the tides change all the time. So we can predict ahead, and we start uh, firming it up, and we send the welcome <coughs> letter uh, to the ship and to Captain Costello. And you've seen the welcome letter that's over here. That's the letter from the last ship that came in here. So we, we um, make sure that that letter goes out and you're welcome to take it with you, um, the letter. Then uh, from that, we uh, start the uh, pilot information book. And those are those books uh, that you see over there. We do about 30 of those for each ship. The ship gets 12, um, and all the information there is all in, sent to the ship electronically. And then uh, we try to send the sail mail, but we've had cases where the sail mail couldn't catch up to the ship because of changing uh, or sitting on some supply ship somewhere. It's, it could be an issue. So I like it now that we have the, the uh, electronics. And then, uh, we have, we have a security meeting with all those security people, and sometimes there's as many as 70 uh, come down, and we meet at the Port Authority, and we start going over a security plan. And what uh, the NCIS comes, and the Navy lets us know what they think the, the threats are, uh, what uh, all the local, they all work together. And believe me when I tell you, there's so much involved in that that you never see. If you watch the parade here, you just never know what's really going on behind the scenes. So that, that's a very important part of it. And each one of the organizations gets one of those <coughs> books for that ship. So that everybody involved, the ship, the officials, the, the security, uh, the city crew, the Port Authority crew, they all have that book. We're all working off the same uh, timing issues. Everything is in there. The only thing that isn't in there is the security plan. That doesn't go out. On communications, uh, funding traffic is our, uh, we don't deal with the U.S. Coast Guard here as far as handling ships. We deal with the Canadian Coast Guard. So funding traffic is an ECORREC, which is the border crossing uh, control for Canada. It's in Halifax. The Navy, as a military ship, does not have to report to ECOREC. They do have to report to funding traffic. But I encourage them, and everyone has done it, if you tell ECOREC where you are, what time you're going to be certain places, there's a good chance it's going to lessen the chances of you having a collision with somebody else. And so far, every captain's figured out that that's probably a good thing, <laughs> but you never know. I send a letter to uh, all the lobster fishermen, uh, both this last last time, both sides of the border, uh, to let them know the ship's coming and this is the route, the route's drawn out, so that if they have gear and they leave it in on that route, and they can't complain if they lose it. These DDGs have propellers that stick out so far past the sides 
and it's just like a giant uh, buzzsaw going down through if there's lobster gear there. Since we started doing this, we haven't had a single complaint from any of the lobster. Before that, we did, and it just live and learn, but we got that done. The other issue that's big for us is vendors. The trash pickup, which is a lot from the ship, providing water, sewer, uh, the power company has hookups to go, <coughs> the tugs, the chamber of commerce to let the all their members know what's going to happen, the radio and newspapers, and fuel delivery companies if needed. Uh, and s if these ships uh, need fuel, usually uh, Dysox or Irving gets the call and they send, they'll send 10, 12,000 gallon tankers now and you, you're looking at a lot of fuel and a big bill. I don't know what it's going to be this year but I'm sure it's more. And we let the uh, Navy support facility in Bath know. Bath will send up, uh, if they need uh, vans, uh, anything, Bath will send the stuff up. So it's a, it's a system that we've worked out over 40 years. It seems to work pretty well. And the Navy just, the, the ships are just blown away. They are blown away by everybody working together on that. <coughs> so on the performance, uh, as soon as we get aboard the ship, we have a meeting. We discuss the, the passage plan, the docking evolution, how uh, that's going to work, and the security. Uh, occasionally, uh, we'll have a Mountie uh, with us in the Canadian waters and uh, somebody from the Coast Guard for the American waters, so they're there to help with the security. The one thing we don't want somebody, the ship to do is to, uh, by accident, uh, shoot up the wrong boat coming towards them with, with some friendly people in it. And that always goes, that never goes over well. Guarantee. So that's why we have um, both security from both sides there to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Um, every we have equipment that uh, records the position uh, every ten seconds, and we can plot, plot that out later. And the reason we do that is is you can see uh, how close you were to your plan. Why did the ship? do this or do that, what was the current there, and you can use that for future reference when you're handling ships. And then we prepare an after action report, which is always interesting, and it's in that uh, book that I, if it's passing up there. Each ship puts that out so that the next ship coming gets a copy of that, and they know what happened, and they know why it happened. And we usually get a video of the parade and a quantitized newspaper, and we do an analysis of the visit and the security lessons we learn, and we send that out to the vessel. And they really like that. It's most ports they leave and they never hear from them again in a port visit like this. With us, we do follow through. So the question is, what are we going to do in the future? And right now, the answer is, I don't have a clue, because we've gone from a 600 ship navy, we're down to 200 and. 60 ships maybe, 270 in that range, and are they going to have enough ships so that they can uh, siphon one off now and then to go to a port visit like us? Even though it's great training, they miss, may not just have enough uh, ships of people. The second issue is political. As long as we ha keep getting the same caliber of senators we've had uh, in the last 40 years, it probably won't be an issue, but it could be. And that uh, usually main ends up with uh, s senators from opposite parties, almost always. And that helps because it's something they can cooperate on. So that's the political side of this. If they can cooperate and say, look, you know, we're working with each other, great. The third thing, and it's this year's especially, uh, what's going to happen geopolitically? Is Russia going to invade Ukraine? What are the Chinese going to do about Taiwan? Those issues directly affect whether we get a ship or not. Especially, I think, the Russian situation is going to, uh, any ships that are on the East Coast will be going over. And that's, that's an issue. That's why I can't predict what, what Putin's going to do. 
what are the, what are the Chinese going to do in Taiwan? But the future is in somebody's crystal ball, and it ain't mine. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? On the security issue, you got all the local boats inside the harbor and on the north wall. Mm -hmm. Depending how big the ship is, it sticks out on both sides, and those boats have to get pretty close. Yeah. So do you have any kind of meeting with them as we as, as far as yes, we take photographs of all the boats, and in the ready room where the guys get their weapons, the photographs of all the boats are right there. So the, the normal boats that are here, they've seen them before the ship ever arrives. And if there's a people come in on the 4th, that's why they put that boat out there, yeah. patrolling back and forth, just to make sure that people stay. You, if you start towards that ship really fast or something, you're going to find out that those bullets are faster, actually. Mm -hmm. So yes, they, they do. They watch that carefully. Yes, I was just going to say, Bobby, uh, it's happened to me several times, actually, coming back uh, with my boat from the like, from playing golf or back or whatever, and, and of course, I, I'm trying to go slow, but even so, there's several uh, small boats right around the ship, and when they see me coming, they, they just they they fly over to me, and see what's going on. So they, they're, they're on top of that all the time. Yeah. Since what happened to uh, uh, in uh, Aiden, when the U.S. destroyer got a small boat, two guys on it, came into the side of it and killed 17 of our sailors. Since that day, they get real nervous now when boats start to come alongside. And that's <coughs> that's always part of the security situation. Yes, ma'am. Could you say a little bit about your background? I assume you were in the Navy, possibly? I was in the Navy 30 years uh, in the reserves. Uh, I went to Maine Maritime Academy. I got, uh, I shipped out on the Great Lakes for a short period of time and then on the ocean and worked for Sun Oil for five years and then uh, went captain with ocean management and I started sailing captain at 26 and I was captain of the largest ship ever to fly U.S. flag in history when I was 29 to this day, you know, uh, just lucky. Wow. Um, but during that time I was doing active duty for training with the Navy, uh, two weeks. We didn't have to do weekends because we were already at sea. So we, you know, they figured that that's a pretty good training. So. But through that, I got to go on a lot of different. But one year, they would send me where they wanted me. And the next year, I'd tell them where I wanted to go. And so we shifted back and forth. But almost all my time for them was as a training officer for ship handling in giant models, the 60-foot models. Little Creek, Virginia, or uh, working on uh, USS New Jersey. I was the merchant marine liaison officer, working with fueling issues, uh, on security issues with the SEALs. Uh, we did a lot of training with the SEALs in Alaska, where I was captain of the merchant ship, a big one. And then the SEALs would come on at night, 200 miles out of Alaska. They would drop in from a C-130, get in their rafts, and come up and board us. And practice all night long, mm -hmm. and it was always interesting, you know. So it, it, uh, the Navy was very, very, very good to me. They, I got to go places and see things I would never have gotten otherwise. What kind of things did you do? In, you mentioned DC a couple of times. I was assigned to the Pentagon, uh, working. Uh, they had six patrol craft, no seven. Uh, their hundred and eighty foot long. Uh, high-speed patrol boats, which they wanted for the for the uh, Persian Gulf, uh, for the Gulf War coming up. And my job was to charter a ship that sank. You bring them all on and pick it up, and it can take all eight at once with the crews and all ready to go. And they took it across, and when they get to the Persian Gulf, they sink it, and they all go running off. And it worked very well. But they, they I saw things in the Navy that they were chattering ships during the, the Gulf War. At one of them was a ship that I've been captain on. At ten times the daily rate that it cost to run, mm -hmm. and all they had to do was offer the owner <laughs> two or three times, and they would have got it. But no, they decided to go with 
Well, it's like the Navy, it's always more expensive. Yeah, they, so they, they, uh, they listen to us. They, that's what the Merchant Marine guys do. That's their living. They know it. The Navy doesn't. The Navy doesn't have a clue about the merchants. They really don't. So they bring in Merchant Marine officers as Navy officers to do some. So, so 30 years of that was fun. It really was. I was lucky. So. so the last couple of years, there's been a decrease in ship traffic mm -hmm. here. And how has that affected your day-to-day -day life? And then what are you expecting? as, as they, Are you expecting things to increase again? What yes, I think in, there? based on what I, I'm seeing with, <coughs> with chips, uh, from what the mill's telling us, they're going to start up again in June, shipping overseas. Right now, everything from the mill is going domestic, everything, because the price is higher than what they can get in China. China's uh, paper consumption has dropped dramatically because of COVID, dramatically. So they found out they could sell it in the States. They've got the tissue mill, and they're going to start producing. They, they've just been producing the giant rolls that are 8 foot wide and 16 feet long. <coughs> they're going to start producing the paper towels and the tissue in woodland. So that's going to take some of the production. But I think they all come back in June. I believe we'll start shipping wood chips as early as May to Europe, uh, some to Dominican Republic, different places. And some chips go for, uh, for making power because they're carbon neutral. And in Europe especially, they don't want to burn oil or gas if they can burn wood, believe it or not. So that's a big issue. So I think that'll change. The passenger ship situation, <coughs> is, as can tell you, is, it's up in the air. We know that uh, at least two ships uh, want to come here for about eight or ten calls. But what we don't know is what's going to happen because uh, Bar Harbor has given the ships a terrible time. Mm -hmm. about coming here. And they're looking. Uh, there's a guy here in town right now looking. So I think uh, there's a big chance that we will see more ships, uh, passenger ships, cruise ships. If not this year, then certainly next year. <coughs> we already know that there's companies that uh, want to come. The problem for the cruise ship companies is they're in such a mess with the, with the CDC mm -hmm. that they just don't know what they're what to do, and it's uh, it's an issue that affects us directly in this town. And believe me, she can tell you it's affected me directly financially. And so you're just out playing golf all the time. No, <laughs> not quite. <laughs> but it's uh, but it's Portland's in the same boat. Portland had 120 cruise ships two years ago. We had none last year. None. So far this year, uh, Penobscot Bay is in the same boat. Bar Harbor is real. Bar Harbor had no ship. We had one cruise ship here. We had more than the rest of the state combined. <laughs> that was it, you know. So it's uh, it's been a real issue. Also, the pulp mills in the, you know, that go through uh, Penobscot Bay and through Portland, they've all switched to domestic sales. So they're in exactly the same boat, but Pulp, which is a big commodity leaving Maine. So it's really had an effect on this state. It's tremendous. Not so much in the pulp mills workers, but the truckers uh, and the shipping has just been devastating. So, but I've had good years and I've had bad years, like anything else. That show me the business that doesn't have that and uh, be one night, oh, they work for the government. You know. <laughs> The improvements to the fish pier, is that still in the design or is that fun implementation funded? And if so, when? The, I, I don't know this week what's happened, but definitely the, the, plan, the planning has been contracted for, the, the plans. Uh, so, and it's pretty expensive just to do the, the planning. The planning for the wing wall that comes off the pier to protect the harbor from the southeast, that was all done in the original plan for the pier. So that's finished and ready to go. <coughs> what we're hoping is we'll get a grant to do both. And then that would help because we can uh, bring in some 
more vessels the size of the of the one to Pauline that's down there now. And that really helps the, the Port Authority. The Port Authority survived with no ships because of the diversification diversification that Chris has done in real estate and all kinds of different things. And the, the Coast Guard uh, office uh, is paid for. So that money, uh, we used to pay the, had to pay the mortgage on that. We don't anymore. And that brings in about a quarter of a million dollars a year to the Port Authority. That's what the GSA pays the Port Authority for that operation. We have expenses against that, maintenance and that sort of thing, but nothing like before was <coughs> paying that mortgage off. We had a burning <laughs> for the mortgage, but it really helped. So Eventually when they implement that, will it, how disruptive will it be or is it, you know, the fish pier doesn't really affect the boats going in and out? No, there? no. We've made, made certain that that's, I would guess, based on what I've seen, that they would probably do one uh, first and then do <coughs> the other. Uh, it, but uh, to build the wing wall out to the dolphin uh, shouldn't take more than a month total time. Mm -hmm. So that's not a, it depends on the time of the year that you do that. But you try to stay out of the scallop season over there. <coughs> and the other part of the pier, I don't know. What is the av uh, the depth of the water beside the pier, and also uh, the average depth in the channel? And is the channel all in Canadian water? Uh, from about 300 feet out, it is. It's uh, very deep. The Canadian, the the channel from 100 feet off the pier drops down to 150 to 200 feet, and by the time you get out to East Quarry, it's 600 feet wow. deep. So it's the deepest approach of any harbor, except for a few up in Washington State. How much water do most of the, sh the big ships need? They come in here. None of them draw much more than 38, 39 feet. And that's what we have downtown for draft. And we have 62 feet out at the uh, cargo pier. So uh, we're one of the few places in the world that doesn't worry about dredging. You know, it's not an issue. We've got it. And it's uh, it really helps. The cruise ships, they're almost all at 20 six, 27 feet, and you see the size of these ships now. The new one that just came out, Symphony of the Seas, I think, it's going to carry up to 6,000 passengers and 3,000 crew, and it's got the same draft at 25, 27 feet. It just goes up, you know, wider and higher. And I, I don't know about you guys, but... Yeah, <laughs> when you get in the heavy water. Yeah, wow. this could be a big issue. I. This is going to be a disaster for some cruise ship somewhere. You know, yeah. <laughs> when it goes over, it's going to be bad. Yes, sir. Of the, the cruise ships that kind of are going to come in here, are they the large kind that, you know, three, four thousand passengers? Uh, no, no, no. No, no, no. Okay. no the, the uh, Pearl Miss carries 167, yeah. something like that. And, uh, but we can take, you know, we can take ships easy. I mean, like the size of the Riviera for a day. And they, you, we, we used to, when the 4th of July comes, we used to 10,000 people in town, right? So you bring in 1,000 on a cruise ship, it's just good for business. Plus, if they're not staying overnight, they're, they're gone. So it's a, this, there is a fine line there. Where that line is, we don't know yet. You know, it's something we gotta figure out. Anybody else? Uh, when you're in the process of lining up the ships, you said something about sending out a pilot's information booklet? Yeah, that's the the book that's over there. Oh, okay. That's yeah. what you send them? Yes. Electronically first, and then try to get it to them physically. But they, uh, it's, with the way the mail system works with the ships and they get diverted so often, it's tough to catch up. So is it all about navigation in that booklet, or yeah. is it what? Everything. Everything, okay. Take a look. Okay. Anyway. Well, I just want to say, you mentioned about the, the sailors, Martha through town, the welcome they get and the feeling they had, but it can't compare to the feeling that we have standing there, yeah. watching them parade down through town, and everybody standing up, clapping, cheering, crying, I'm doing it now. And yeah. every year I do it. It's, 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 it's the most incredibly mm -hmm. emotional 
for I live for the fourth. I love the fourth of July. But that stands above and uh, beyond every yeah. memory you have. You know, for me, watching it, uh, the parade, I feel like, you know, these young people, men and women, are all willing to give up their life for me. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate that. Yeah. And it and the way things are in the world today, and with the weapons that are out there, uh, it could happen. And let alone accidents, that's a whole other issue. But I really respect them that they're, they know, believe me, every one of those kids knows when they go on that ship, they know that it's a risky job. None of them believe, oh, it can't happen to me. They, I've, I've been so impressed with how realistic they are about their training, their behavior. Uh, the behavior of the sailors now in port is so different from 40 years ago. It's unbelievable, the change. But they're much more serious. And the other issue is they, the equipment that they're handling now in these ships um, is just amazing. And it's all electronic. Uh, very, uh, very little hands-on weapons. It's all missiles and the NUMCA system uh, on these TDGs projects the ship electronically up in the air about 500 feet above the ship. And the entire ship, if you look on radar, that's the target. That's where the missile's going to go. And it goes 500 feet over the top of you and it's gone. So I got talking to this kid downtown. He said, what do you do? He says, ah, oh, something you've never heard of, the Nunca. And I said, ah, it's the Australian system that projects the ship <laughs> up overhead. And is it the Mark I or the Mark III that you're working on? <laughs> I was in civilian clothes, the kid didn't have a clue. And he says, that's top secret. <laughs> so not quite. <laughs> but, but having seen, I, I got a demonstration uh, when we were going out of what that system does. And it's incredible. And you know, some kid sitting there at 18, 19 years old, making this entire ship disappear and go up 500 feet. So that's the kind of stuff that they're trained for and that they're doing that, you know, it was tough in, in World War II, Korea, those days, Vietnam, but it was all hands-on physical weapons. Now, there's very few physical weapons that they're using. It, it's more the, the guards around the ship, and that's about it. Yeah. So the, I was on the Jersey, we fired the 16-inch guns a couple times. And it took, each turret had 50 people in the upper turret, and then another 40, 50 down in the magazines down below the turrets is sending the weapons up. So it took 100 people to fire those three guns in each turret. So there's 300 people just in the turrets. And they had a weapons department of 800 people. Just the weapons department. Whereas today you can fire that same amount of, of uh, firepower with maybe 10 people. In fact, the, the DDGs that come in here have the forward and the after uh, vertical launch missile systems. And now they're putting as many as four missiles into one of those launchers. And they can put up 500 missiles in one, one guy with one button. You know, you just pick which target you want and send it up. It's a totally changed world that these kids are going out in. And the training they get, um, I'm not familiar with the Army, a little with the Marine Corps, but the Navy, uh, training is just unbelievable. The schools are so good. And then after they get out of school, they get sent out to the fleet. And they practice again for six months before they really let them off on their own. So it's a, it's a, for a kid that is looking for, for a good education um, in the Navy, and then a good education after they get out that's paid for, there's nothing better, nothing. And it, unless it's the Merchant Marine Academy, <laughs> it's a different world. Yes, Would you say again what the purpose is of projecting the ship up 500 feet? So that when an <laughs> incoming missile doesn't see the ship in, sitting on the surface of the oh, water, okay. it sees the ship 500 feet in the air. Oh, okay. And it so just goes, goes away. It's, Interesting. It's a different world.
and they can make it not directly overhead. They can push it off to the side or wherever we should. Yeah. 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 It's different. Thank you very much.